Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Maria Gutierrez Vera, and I'm one of your three Athenaeum fellows this year. In September of 1928, Sir Alexander Fleming successfully and accidentally isolated penicillin in his lab. This famed accident set off a chain of events that would lead to the mass production of penicillin, street wartime wounds, and eventually the creation of other antibiotics. Today, penicillin and other antibiotics serve as the primary treatment for infections, as well as a prevent preventative measure in humans, farm animals, and even plants. Penicillin and other antibiotics have resulted in a substantial decline in global deaths from infections like syphilis and tuberculosis. However, almost 100 years since their discovery, we have a new threat to the efficiency of antibiotics. The advent of antibiotic-resistant bacteria has worried doctors, scientists, and physicians worldwide. Like all organisms, bacteria adapt and evolve to their environments through a process of natural selection. However, bacteria reproduce absurdly quickly, meaning that bacteria that develop defenses against antibiotics can rapidly survive, reproduce, and spread. Therefore, the more antibiotics are used, the more opportunities bacteria have to improve their defenses and the less effective antibiotics become. However, as these changes evolve and require significant sustained investment, the antibiotic drug development sector has declined rapidly due to a lack of funding and skepticism from the pharmaceutical industry. Here to talk about the challenges ahead is Ryan Sears, a biochemist and entrepreneur with a background in molecular biology and genetics. He is a CEO slash CSO of Re Revagenics Inc., a preclinical stage biopharmaceutical company dedicated to the discovery and development of life-changing and life-saving medicines. Previously, he was founder and vice president of research at Acogen, a pharmaceutical company focused on discovering, developing, and commercializing innovative antibacterials to treat multi-drug resistant infections. He oversaw early stage drug research and provided intellectual insights and support to all things related to infectious diseases, including late stage development, commercialization, and medical affairs. Sirs earned his PhD in biochemistry from the Scripps Research Institute and his Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from Penn State University. Now, before we begin, we must ask that you all abide by the Athenaeum's health guidelines. Please keep your masks on, over your nose and mouth, for the remainder of the program indoors. If you would like to take a drink of water, we kindly ask that you step outside of the Eckerd Dining Room to do so. Please take a moment now to silence your cell phones, Check that your mask is properly fitted, and remember that, as always, video and audio recordings are strictly prohibited. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ryan Suris to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. Great. Thank you so much for the, uh, the kind introduction, and um, it's a real pleasure to be here. You all have a really special uh, seminar series here. I'm envious. Um, so yeah, I, I'm excited to talk uh, about a topic that I'm super passionate about today that I hope I've found the right blend of science and uh, storytelling and uh, medical need and also economics and policy and, and kind of how we got into this mess and how we're at least thinking about uh, getting out of it. So I, I'm so used to the stats, I didn't even have a slide in today until I realized probably not everyone thinks about this problem every day. Um, but you know, antimicrobial resistance, a, as was alluded to in the introduction, it, it's this kind of persistent um, global threat. Um, we haven't been using antibiotics for very long. Uh, I was telling the story today that my parents were the first generation born into the world where antibiotics already existed before their birth. Um, so it really has been a pretty short run. Uh, and data, you know, as we look outside the United States, especially into areas that, you know, have all kinds of uh, challenges, we see, you know, really high rates of resistance to pretty serious antibiotics, drugs that you've probably never seen in your life. You're probably used to, at most, getting, you know, some amoxicillin or a z pack when you go to the doctor. We're talking about hardcore IV drugs for sepsis and pneumonia not working anymore. Um, and we do see that in the United States. It's just not nearly as common as it is outside. Um, so it's a growing problem, but it's a persistent problem because it's an evolutionary problem, um, that there isn't a kind of magic bullet to just stop it. So here's sort of the, <coughs> uh, the interesting way to open. Um, just thinking as a scientist or an entrepreneur, imagine if you uh, successfully predicted a, a pretty major medical crisis, uh, and then, you know, 10 years in the past, and then developed a drug <coughs> 
that generated data that looked like these. And so these are two different ways to show mortality uh, in a trial, and they're typically used in cancer drug trials, right, not antibiotic trials, because nobody dies from infections here. Uh, but this was real data um, from a trial we ran that are, that's published in the New England Journal, um, where drug A was the new drug, drug B was the, the best available therapy remaining. Um, this trial was predominantly run in Greece, Turkey, Israel, because at the time, back in 2012, they had a lot, much higher incidence of this type of problem than the US, so just logistically. Um, and what we see is the drug is given in the two-week window. The drug's job is to save your life then, because you're dying of an infection. Um, and <clears throat> that window ends, and then you measure mortality for any number of other causes, uh, cancer, heart attack, get hit by a bus, anything. Um, it's the way the FDA likes the trials run. And the data pretty much couldn't be better, right? You separate the lines when you're supposed to, and then actually they parallel track. Uh, and when you look at all-cause mor all mortality at a fixed point, which the FDA loves, uh, you see a pretty substantial mortality impact. I never in a million years when I entered this field thought you could possibly run a trial that generated these data ethically. Uh, but that's how close we came to running out of effective drugs in Greece in 2012. Um, and that drug was the drug we ultimately took to market um, that became our undoing. So the sort of the backdrop is, I can't believe we were even able to run a trial to show this. That's how desperate things got for a couple years in Europe before the new wave of drugs got approved. Um, and so these are the types of differences we're looking at. So just a really brief history on the company, just to kind of set the stage for some of the, the history part of it. So the company was founded in 2004, kind of sits right in the South San Francisco biotech hub. Um, if you drive up US 101 towards San Francisco, you'll pass the buildings that it used to be uh, a part of, never the entire building. Um, and really kind of the things that hallmarked what we were doing was we really focused early on on a specific type of bacteria that I'll just touch on later, the basic science, but they're called gram-negative bacteria. So when you see stuff in the news, you'll see that term used. Um, that was a big deal because people weren't thinking about that problem yet. It was rare, um, but it seemed like a relentless problem that would be hard to solve, which means we would fall further and further behind in, in having effective drugs. Um, the other thing we did actually that's not on here is we really partnered heavily with the federal government to do all of our research and development. Um, we were birthed in an era after the anthrax attacks, and the government started to become much more concerned about using antibiotic resistant versions of the bio threat pathogens that we all always worry about, or we all in my field. Um, and we happen to be working on gram-negative threats like Yersinia pestis, plague, Francisella tularensis. So we partnered heavily with the government to develop our drugs for resistant hospital infections and then demonstrate in animals that they work on resistant bio threats. So that was actually a huge part of our strategy and ultimately was a, a, a major hallmark for the company, this idea of partnering with the government. Um, in the end, in our history, we actually took four homegrown programs. I mean, we invented, we took them forward through kind of that first phase before you enter clinical testing. Um, in the gram-negative space um, with that, you know, our first drug FDA approved in 2018. But that was really the most number of programs that went into that kind of clinical testing in this space in that era, meaning even the biggest pharmaceutical companies, we were really pretty prolific. Um, we also were pretty small. We were about 45 people through most of the history I'll show, um, only going to a few hundred people right at the end as we were trying to actually commercialize a product. So we were small and scrappy, but punching out of our weight class because we had you know, huge partnerships with the federal government. So just to give kind of, a, again, I think the history is important because I think the timeline is just to set like how long did all this work take. So, so this is the development timeline just for the product that we took from literally first synthesis in a hood, James Agan, the chemist. You never forget the person that first synthesized it for the first time. Um, from that moment all the way to the approval. But we were doing lots of other things. We had four or five other programs in the clinic. We had lots of research. So it was a, it was a highly prolific organization. But the most important timeline is how long did it take to get the drug from first concept to approval and then what happened. Um, and then I always like the scaler. It's only been about 75 years we've had these drugs. And as much as we're sort of a, a, a young company that came in for a little while and went away, it represents 20% of the entire time period that we've even had antibiotics in existence. Um, so I got to, as it was mentioned earlier, I got to Scripps in 2002 um, by, by luck, by coincidence of science, um, the company was founded off of some of the work I was doing for my thesis work in 2003. So pretty much a year into grad school, obviously I'm doing all of my publications, and, but I watched this company be birthed, and I'm kind of keeping, we're collaborating, we're learning. Um, I ended up joining a couple years later. Um, the program that actually birthed the drug plasmomycin started in about 2005. 
it was first actually created, the first time that molecule was ever existed on the planet, the first time the synthesis was complete and tested, it was about 2006. We don't know it's the drug then because there's lots of molecules and you're picking and you don't know. Um, but so then the first, so then pick the drug, um, take it through all the preclinical testing to be allowed to enter in human study, and finally the first human clinical study starts in 2008. So not too bad from like, you know, basically full startup to um, a homegrown molecule being in people for the first time. Um, there were several, you do several safety studies, and then we did our first efficacy study uh, in 2010, kind of making sure you got the right dose before you do the big expensive phase three studies, and then we kind of got stuck. Um, but one big thing that happened is, um, right in this period in 2010, um, BARDA, who if, if any of you have ever heard of them, you've certainly heard of them in the last year uh, with COVID, but their main mission is medical preparedness and developing assets to be ready for when there is some kind of bio attack or a pandemic. Um, and so like Moderna's original contract um, before COVID was for Ebola, that's with BARDA, right? So they're, we were the first example of them actually partnering with a company to try to develop medical countermeasures for resistant bio threats, antibiotic resistant bio threats. So that was a huge um, boost to the company because it gave us a tremendous, tremendous amount of resources. So the phase two finishes and we get stuck. And we don't start a phase three for three years. Why? Well, there was a big battle at the FDA about how we were gonna develop this drug. Um, the old model was you do massive trials with thousands of patients and you, know, you run two of them just because, because you know, that gives you extra confidence. And we said to the FDA, we've got a drug for a high unmet medical need, um, but we're not, we can't afford that. The economics don't support that kind of trial. The investors wouldn't support it. Um, and we actually got into a really interesting debate where we ended up leading the way on running a completely new type of development path the only problem is we ran it in reverse order of how you should now, now that we've done it. <laughs> so we started the trial that I showed that really impressive mortality data. Like, that's really hard to do. You have to, there's a very precise moment in time you can run a trial ethically to show that kind of outcome um, before you can't show it again because now you know the new drug's better and you're not allowed to even ever try. Um, but that study was a long process of agreeing with the FDA what it would look like. And in the end, there's an eight hour FDA workshop on why that study was maybe not the best idea. Um, it cost a uh, million dollars a patient, and it took three years to get 36 people enrolled in the trial. Um, and there's lots of interesting scientific reasons why that is, uh, that apply to you know, any drug that would go through it. Um, but what the company did by trying to do this type of trial to the best of our ability with the FDA and ultimately struggling, is it allowed them, they, they finally opened their eyes and said, we're gonna allow you to do a much smaller, much just standard vanilla phase three clinical trial We'll use the data from your mortality trial as descriptive, supportive evidence that this is a high unmet need, but it won't statistically support the approval because it's just not enough people. It'll take 30 years to enroll. Um, and that actually was the first, what we now call this tier B development path. Um, and so there's actually a new way to develop unmet need antibiotics that still exists because of this, this work. Um, you just would want to do it in the opposite order of what we did and take about half the amount of time and money we did. Um, but it was a big hallmark for the field to, to, to fight this with the FDA. So I guess the, the arc of the story is really, it was never easy. There was always battles and leading and trying to get change and working with regulators and the government. Um, but finally we're at the other side and we had that really impressive data and the other trial had really impressive data. So the trials, <laughs> you can see how quickly the second phase three basically caught up and finished in eight months. So it shows you when you have a clear cut trial design how fast you can move. Um, then because of the data I showed you, this drug got breakthrough therapy designation. That's never happened for an antibiotic. It just, it's for cancer drugs and rare disease drugs. So that was a huge moment, right? The FDA is saying, here's the highest accolade we can award the drug. Um, we filed the last you know, filing before you wait for the approval decision from the FDA. Uh, we got it the drug approved and it launched right away, which was, shows you how hard we invested. Um, Medicare awarded the drug its accolade, which is called NTAP. It means Medicare is willing to pay extra money to help reimburse kind of a high, a new, it's called new technology add-on payment. It's just their designation to say, this drug has high value, we'll pay extra for it uh, for Medicare. So now FDA and Medicare have both given it their best gold star, and we filed bankruptcy eight months later. <laughs> so it was a battle the entire way, none of it was easy, and at the end, it was a big, you know, fat failure um, after everything could have gone right scientifically and medically. So sorry that took a while, but I think that stage needs to be set to kind of set the depth of how, how this problem, uh, how it evolved. So here's, here's our ticker. We were actually a public company. We were a private company for 10 years, but we were a public company for about five years. 
and the marks I put on it are sort of like everything just kind of bouncing around, the trials are taking a long time, it's costing a lot of money, and then the data comes out and boom, people are like, wow, this drug saved lives, the other trial looked really impressive, they're both published in New England Journal, um, everyone gets really excited and we rush up to a billion dollar company. Then we start to approach FDA approval and everyone realizes, well, it's really great that this drug saves lives, but it's not gonna make any money. And then boom, the company collapses and we can no longer raise funds because our, the, the only way to raise money is to sell stock and our stock value collapsed. Um, so this is just showing the realization of the excitement around the data and the realization that this market doesn't really work, um, the antibiotic market. So we'll, we'll talk about that. So that, that's essentially the history part of the company. Um, so I'm gonna pivot real quick just to a little bit of the scientific, you know, why is it hard to find these new products and then come back to the economics. Um, you know, a, a nice reminder is, <clears throat> what was it like in the before time? Um, so before antibiotics, and again, it hasn't been that long, you know, 70% of Staph aureus bacteremias were fatal, right? You died from them. Um, and I, I can't believe, because streptococcus is like one of the easiest pathogens, like you treat it with a Z pack or sometimes even penicillin or amoxicillin still, but 33% of all of those infections, even if they weren't invasive, were fatal. Um, that's kind of hard to remember because um, they're so easy to treat now. The pathogens that we worked on, gram negatives, cause things like hospital pneumonia, urinary tract, sepsis, um, so different types of infections. We don't really know. We just know that with pretty suboptimal therapy, you get 40, 50% mortality, because that's the trial. And we know that drug that wasn't doing very well definitely does something. So somewhere above that is where we think the untreated mortality rate is. And I used to show a picture of Ebola because when I talked to students, I was like, these are Ebola mortality rates for like these simple infections we used to treat. And then I, now we have SARS-CoV-2 too, which is very serious, it spreads like crazy, but you can see the mortality. If we were talking 70%, we would be in a very different world um, you know, with that particular pathogen. So you know, they were incredibly deadly infections. They were miracle cures, right? You can cure your gonorrhea in four hours. It's on the mailbox. Like, that's how excited people were. <laughs> but now, which costs more? Amoxicillin or a gallon of clover organic milk? A 10-day course of amoxicillin or a gallon of milk? They actually cost the exact same. So that's how we value those products now. And I, it makes sense. We've had them for a while. We mass produce them overseas, and it's cheap. Um, but the respect for the product kind of gets lost with that, right? Um, so then just another little scientific anecdote. So when we, I'll get back to this gram negative concept. So if you hear things in the field about different pathogens and the CDC has now an annual report where they list like the threats, what should people be focused on? What should we be worried about? The, this gram positive, gram negative term comes up a lot, even, even in the news, sometimes you'll see even in popular press. And the, the real difference is the cell architecture. So the positive and negative comes from the stain, the gram stain that was developed in the 1800s to just look at micro, microbes under the microscope and tell the difference between them. And if you're positive, it means the dye sticks to you. And if you're negative, it doesn't. So that's all that means. But the reason why um, the dye doesn't stick is important. The, the dye doesn't stick because gram-negative bacteria have an additional membrane on the outside that creates this really big challenge to design drugs. So this is why the gram-negative space, the, biz, the medical need and business opportunity arise. It's real true scientific barrier problem, literal barrier and scientific. So if you take a gram-negative bacteria and you kind of zoom in on its cell surface, um, the inside of the cell would be, you know, at the bottom, oh, I realize my cursor's not there, but it, there's inside. Um, so the inside of the cell where all the energy-dependent processes and enzymes are doing essential biology that are very different than our biology, so lots of things you could target with a drug that wouldn't hurt people because they're totally different machines, right? Um, totally opposite problem with cancer, how do you tell the difference between the good cell and the bad cell, right? Here it's really easy to tell the difference. But the problem is we can't get the drug there. So bacteria have you know, all this stuff going on, and then they have a normal cell membrane, just like our membranes, right? Lipid bilayer, um, stops things from just moving in and out. You have to traverse it. Um, bacteria all have a cell wall, right, to give it gram-positive and gram-negative. That gives the cell structure, because it needs to live in water. If we put one of our cells in water, it would just lice. It would pop open, because it doesn't, isn't able to handle the turgor pressure. Um, and that's where gram-positive bacteria stop. And there's lots of good things you can target in the cell wall. All the penicillin, beta-lactam drugs work there, vancomycin. But with the gram-negatives, there's just one extra barrier, and it's another membrane that's actually very different than any other membrane on the planet. Um, it's actually pretty much impermeable, and the only way through are the tiny little water channels. Um, and why that matters is when you're designing a drug, if you want to target something in here, you need to obviously design a molecule that inhibits some process or corrupts it to kill the cell. 
and then you tell the chemist, now to get in, I need you to be highly water soluble to get through this membrane to go through the channels. But then after you're done with that, you need to be highly lipid soluble to get through this membrane, and then you need to bind your target, and then it can't mutate or get resistance. And that's almost impossible. In fact, most of the ways it works reliably are stolen from nature, from natural products that evolved to do this, and we figured, and we're copying and using that idea to create new scaffolds and new chemistry. Um, but ultimately, why this problem became so big was it's a scientific basis. It's harder to find new things for these pathogens because there's an incredibly hard design problem. And just to put some numbers to it, you know, HIV is an incredibly complicated area, but this is not its problem. Its problem is obviously rapid diversification evolution. But if you look at a molecule I worked on um, that was a novel scaffold anti-pseudomonal, so an antibacterial for gram negative, and an HIV protease inhibitor that's on the market, the affinity with which they inhibit their actual biochemical target is very similar. And the cell-based activity for the HIV protease inhibitor is meaning the activity it takes to actually enact that inhibition inside a cell is almost the same. And the reason is it only has to go in human cells because that's where HIV is, right? It's not in its own, it's in our cells. And our cells don't have barriers. They're fine letting stuff, our barriers are skin. Once you're in the bloodstream, then it's kind of blood-brain barrier or something. But in general, they're permissive. And you can see with the antibacterial, despite it being more potent on its actual binding target, it's thousands of fold less potent to act in actually killing the cell. And it's because these organisms evolved to protect themselves and live in you know, these external environments. So why does this matter, the cell-based activity problem? Well, what that does is it takes your dosage you know, through the roof. So if you look at, you know, this is just a sample, uh, I think it's sucrose, but the point is it's a scalar. You look at the daily dose of something like Lipitor, so a cholesterol medication, it doesn't have to deal with any of these problems, it's a really small daily dose. But by the time we get to the drugs I work on, you're talking about sometimes six grams, 18 grams a day going into your vein because that's how much it takes to get the effect on the bacteria because they're so good at protecting themselves and keeping stuff out. Um, and so the consequences of that are you need exquisite pharmacokinetics and tolerability um, and even if you achieve that, you'll probably still have off-target toxicity. So there's lots of interesting biology that's very different with bacteria and human cells. That's easy. That's why everyone does the research and it's like, I got a new antibiotic. But then you have to dose so much drug into people's bodies to get the bacteria, to get the effect. You get all kinds of off-target toxicity. You hit a sodium channel and you have cardiovascular toxicity. You, so that's actually what really creates the scientific barrier for us and why we're just slow. You know, 90% of what I worked on never even made it to be considered to go to clinical trial. Um, and that's why it was such a big deal. We did put four things through that phase because it's really hard to do. Um, so I'll finish there in terms of that's what the barrier, um, you know, really is for, our, 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 for innovating in our space, the science space. Uh, but one last thing, because I just think it's a fun scalar to think about, <coughs> is the vast majority of, of antibiotics we use are either direct natural products that nature invented or we derivatize and try to improve. Um, but we're using the idea of how it even worked because some of them work in these amazing ways you could never design first principles. We're borrowing that from nature. And so somebody else created this scaler that I totally ripped off because I needed it for my point, which is trying to show like the scale of how long microbes have been around versus us. And the reason I bring this up is this is, this is the invention timeline for all the chemistry we're using for our new drugs, for new antibiotics, because we're borrowing from nature. And so I think it's really interesting to look. So the idea is if the, crust, if the crust cools on January 1st, it's a map it to a 12 month calendar, and today is the stroke of midnight on December 31st, that's kind of the scale they put everything on. And so if you look at that scale, you know, microbes show up in February, so, or end of Feb. So we basically have about 10 months of chemical invention happening that's evolving and we're getting all this interesting diversification. That's kind of like our oil well, right? That's our natural resource that got created that we can kind of borrow and steal ideas from and use to protect ourselves to kill bacteria. We're stealing their solutions to fight them. So then the big question is, if you look at other major landmarks, with the last being written history, 30 seconds to midnight, um, we, our oil well was created over 10 months. So then the big question is, if you map this timeline to 1945, when we started actually drilling and mining um, this resource, how long is that? So 10 months of invention, 240 milliseconds of usage before we b used it up. <laughs> so that's how quickly we fumed out the antibiotic supply um, if we're considering that most of it's coming from nature. Um, so it's just kind of an interesting, we're in a deep hole. <laughs> All right, so that's the scientific problem. Um, 
ultimately it's a cell biology chemistry problem, design problem to get new drugs, um, and we're in a pretty deep hole. So we pretty much need constant innovation in this field, but the field is crumbling. So let's talk about the economic piece. So how can an FDA approved drug be worth less than zero dollars? Um, there's actually a two hour, if you have trouble sleeping one night, boot camp that really got the lens focused on this really critical issue I wanna talk about, because I care most about the science, but if we don't fix this, we can't do the science. Um, and this was the thesis statement, your new drug, is, which you hold worldwide rights, has just been approved for free, or the government paid everything, and now you own it. Um, what does it take to get to commercial viability, which means you could pay your bills that year, like you're not spending more than you're making in, in, in a given year. Um, and so the, two, the whole rigor rigmarole is online now, but um, I'll just try to pick kind of the most salient points for here for fun. Uh, but first, like how do biotechs make money, or pharma? But um, it's a little different, but how do, how do any drug make money? Um, well, first you spend money, and you spend money for a very long period of time. <laughs> and then you get this one chance to make money. And it's sometimes only five years, sometimes 10, 15, maybe 20 if you're really lucky. Um, and you get exclusivity extensions. Um, you make, so the two things that we're really missing, that I think we all missed, and the NGOs missed it, the governments missed it, the companies even weren't watching, is that phase three is not only not just the end, it's not even the most expensive part of this. The most expensive part of doing this kind of work is after you get FDA approval. And I'll talk just briefly why that is. And the problem is, um, the whole thesis of this comes on the revenue that's generated in this short window has to be worth the entire enterprise risk adjusted. Because you're gonna try this a few times and fail, one time it'll work. Um, with antibiotics, the challenge, one of the great challenges is your market is never smaller than that at the beginning. Because <laughs> we are working on a rare disease that spreads. And so if you're coming to market at the right time, your market's very small. Later, when the drug's generic and cheap and everyone gets access to it and it's a great thing for the world, um, there's plenty of patients, but, but the problem is the company that, the, really the investors, forget the company, that took the risk need to realize that value um, from that generic phase early, like they need to be pulled into the, the revenue generating phase. Um, and so what was really important was there's this big question, well, you got a drug approved, why are you going bankrupt? Why can't you just raise money or sell more drug? Or, and so we really wanted to shine a light on this branded life cycle. So when you're on the market, wipe out every cost to the left of that and let's study why this isn't a viable business. So this was the thesis for um, that workshop was really focused on justifying the cost. Because I knew going in as a scientist, I got one microbiologist, one commercial person, and one manufacturing person. They were the speakers. Um, and I knew the, the commercial guy, who's a great guy, I was like, everyone's going to hate you, and they're going to think it's your fault. <laughs> they're going to say, you're flying private jets and taking doctors to steak dinners. And, None of that actually happens anymore. That's just not what they do. But so we really wanted to focus on the, the core issues. Um, so it breaks down pretty simply. Um, after you get FDA approved, um, a huge chunk of money, most of it is spent on making drug. I'm gonna talk briefly why, don't wanna get too deep in. And then a huge chunk is um, spent on stuff that you must do to keep the drug on the market. It's not optional. And then the last little bit is like, yeah, you can do some sales and marketing and uh, medical affairs. Um, but I knew that would get poked at, so I'm like, just take that out, forget it. And take all the employees out, no salaries. Let's just focus on what's required by law. Um, and so in this workshop, we really talked about um, the easiest place I can point to, because the data's out there, is if you searched any drug, so uh, this is uh, amatocycline and then our drug, plasmacin, and then you search NDA, you'll find the NDA approval letter from the FDA. Like, it's on the, it's public record. And so in that letter, we'll say, congratulations, your drug's approved. Here's all the things you must do, or we will start to fine you or pull your drug off the market. <laughs> and that's fine. That's normal. Um, but the types of things that are required by law after approval are things like pediatric studies. So for every indication you got your drug approved for, you must run a pediatric clinical trial. Um, often, additional safety PK studies. So our drug, for example, we didn't have enough data in patients with end-stage renal disease, just because there weren't enough that were enrolled in the trial because it just wasn't. So they said, we want to see that. Um, for the other drug, they said, you're approved, but we saw a signal in your phase three. We want you to rerun it. Well, that's $90 million. Um, and then, of course, every antibiotic, we have to do surveillance programs. It's not a huge cost. It's single-digit millions. But you have to actually pay other companies to continue to test your drug in very large studies to show it's not suddenly losing efficacy in the first few years. Um, so this is the easiest defensible case, because this is required. We're told by the FDA that has to be done. Like, it's a law, you have to run a pediatric trial. It will take 10 years and about $40 million. 
because no one wants to enroll kids, so it takes forever. Um, and you know, COVID's different, we need it, we want the vaccine, right? But if you, a UTI drug for a highly resistant pathogen, there's no reason to try the new drug when the old one works, so it's really slow. Um, and then the other piece is, you're still constantly reporting to the FDA. So phase three is definitely not the end, right? Even, even with the vaccines, right? We're under EUA first, then full approval, but there could be a safety signal two years from now, and so you're constantly reporting data. So you need a big team to do that. So that's one piece. And just how does that all stack up? Well, it's almost like the more you do in the phase three, the more punishment you get. So these were three real drugs, and the people on my panel worked on these drugs. You can imagine one's the one we worked on all together. But it, you could guess based on their profiles, but it's like, if you just got one indication, so antibiotics can be used for pneumonia, for in, in abdominal infection, UTI, why not get, do trials in all of them, then you can claim all those things and get even more sales, and this would be great. But actually in our field, first of all, doctors mostly know they work, when they work in one place, they work in the other place, so I don't really need to know. Um, and every trial you do, you have to do another pediatric trial. <laughs> so it makes it that much worse. Um, but these are the costs just for the stuff to keep it on market for these actual drugs after they were approved. Uh, and they're not really that big in numbers. Every drug goes through this. They're just the big numbers for antibiotics when we get into what sales they're doing. So that's that piece. And I, I don't want to belabor the, um, supply ch the supply side just to say it's the most expensive thing. And it's not intuitive because you've spent all this money developing your manufacturing process. But that's phase three. The second you're approved, that process needs to be moved to a commercial manufacturer, a totally different site. And a supply chain, and this is a real supply chain, the only difference is we changed the country flags in the workshop because you would know which, like we would have known which drug, and we were trying not to call anyone out. <laughs> um, but this is real. Like you source raw materials from ideally multiple places, so in case there's an explosion in a factory or God knows what, or an, a pandemic, um, but you're making drug in multiple places, and the end-to-end -end process time for our drug was 24 months. That's actually pretty good. Like, I definitely, we looked at buying some drugs that were 36 to 48 months. So that means like today, if you're like, oh my gosh, we need twice as much drug, I'm like, gotcha, two years from now, you got it. That's how long it takes to fill the chain. So what you wanna do is fill every part of the step with material so that if there's an explosion here, you've got some stuff at least there and some stuff there and you can quickly pivot. That costs a fortune. And people just don't appreciate, you know, this type of manufacturing and, and global distribution. It's just you can't do it inexpensively. So then the, the workshop sort of ends with the answer, which is, if you looked at those three product, real examples, real recent examples, um, they all either lost or were projected to lose based on the cost we knew existed and their sales projection. For seven years after your FDA approved, you lose money. Um, and only in year seven, that year, the money you make selling drug is enough to pay that year's expenses. That's it. Because we're trying to get to sustainability where we don't have to raise money in the market, because this whole workshop was about why are these companies bankrupt, why aren't they just raising more money? The answer is, <coughs> it takes seven years to get to the point where I don't have to raise more money, and no one's willing to hedge you that much money um, for something that's going to lose this much. Um, and year seven just gets you back to where you don't have to raise money from someone else to keep your business running. It doesn't get you back to paying everyone back for the billion dollars you spent. And so that, that's sort of the ultimate, um, you know, that's the ultimate punchline. That workshop was all centered around cost and trying to justify these are reasonable, required costs that no one's arguing we should get rid of. So the next evolution was bio of next year, so the pharmaceutical conference, where we really started to talk about revenue. It, what's the problem in this equation? Is it the costs that we're crazy and we're spending so much more money than everyone in neurology and oncology, or is it that there's no revenue? And it, we knew the answer, but um, it, the next step was to focus on that. So that workshop that we sort of put out there really demonstrated the costs are normal. This is what everyone does. Um, if anything, we're on doing it on small scale compared to like you know a new cholesterol medicine. Um, but our revenues are really just they're just too low. And so it's a super simple equation. Where does your revenue come from? It's the price times how much you sell. <laughs> and so, but if we break down the volume, how much we sell, it's how many people there are that need to be treated plus an important number, we always think about price in terms of days of therapy. It's just, it's just how it is, I don't know why. Um, and so the number of doses the patient gets. So the real fatal flaw for antibiotics for resistant infections, because in the old days, in the 90s, you came out with a new antibiotic and you said use this for everything. So just stop using the old one. Just This is better. We're trying not to do that anymore. We're saying only use this when the old one doesn't work. That immediately creates an orphan population. Um, and we cure that population in about five to seven days with an inability to charge a high price. 
and it's that simple. It's a short duration cure for an orphan disease um, where you can't charge a high price. So the only way to get the revenue up is one of the numbers has to go up. The so days of therapy, meaning we're gonna cure you in five to seven days, we're just gonna assume no one wants to unengineer that because that would be horrible, right? Okay, this cures you, but it takes 15 months. And there are drugs through this whole cycle of antibiotic failure that are succeeding. Um, and they're succeeding because they're for chronic indications. So there's a type of mycobacteria called non-tuberculosis. It's a clade of bacteria that cause chronic lung infections. The first drug to come out for that, and it's, it's actually a generic drug that's just been reformulated, is really being, it's economically successful. And I was at an FDA workshop, and the person tried to claim it was because they did so much better engaging patients and all that. And I said, how long do you treat your patients? And they said, oh, 15 months. I said, oh, well, we treat ours in six days. So I said, if you took your revenue and divided by 90, because that's the difference, like how much revenue do you have? Oh, I'm the same as us. <laughs> so there, there are places that sadly, well, it's not sad, but like you can maneuver around and find a way to solve this, but you leave everyone in the hospital dying of sepsis out of it. You have to go to the place where you, you know, um, so we're trying to fix that. So, but, so if duration is locked, we're curing you fast, then price and number of patients, that's all we can do. And you can actually in the US charge anything you want. No one will stop you. Um, the problem is in the hospital, and this is Medicare setting this, 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 this rule, right? In the hospital, if you get an antibiotic, the hospital's paying for that. Insurance does not pay for that. Medicare sets the tone and then private insurance follows. So if you go in and you have a heart attack and the hospital says, here's your money for that, and if you need antibiotics, that's on you. And you could take it out of this payment, but it's your decision. And it creates an intense uh, you know, you know, economic pressure to not use expensive drugs. It's just the bottom line. You go out of the hospital and everything flips upside down and it's motivating to use expensive drugs. It's, it's very, I mean, it's not bizarre. It's completely logical, um, but it's not really well known. The number of patients, obviously there's only so many patients. Um, we can wait till there's millions, but nobody wants us to. So we're in this trap where we come too early for the size of the market. And not only that, are we limited by the size of the population? If we've done a good job, it's only tens of thousands. Um, there's definitely, there's definitely over-prescribing of antibiotics, so I won't argue that, but there's absolutely under-prescribing of better ones because of money. Um, and you will not capture the whole population size because some of it will be legitimate concern, I wanna save this drug for the next person, but a lot of it's just, this one's really expensive and I gotta pay for it, so let's try the cheap one first. Um, so you never get to the full size anyways. In oncology, this just doesn't happen. Nobody says, let's try cisplatin first and then you get Herceptin, you get the best drug. Um, but in our field, it's, the data's out there. Um, so if you took a, an indication with like 20,000 patients, which is kind of a good job, you're on time to market, a price that hospital could tolerate, they'd still complain about, would be about 150 bucks a day. If you cure them in seven days, your peak revenue is $21 million, right? For, that's peak if you get everybody. I mean, that's at least tenfold away from sustainable, right? When you're spending a billion dollars to get there. And the, the data is real. So this is by... Uh, Alan Needham, who was an analyst that covered the Cajun and a bunch of other antibiotic companies and now works with um, the AMR Action Fund. So these are um, numbers of courses sold as the new drugs were launching. So the one flaw that I need to get Alan to replot this for me someday is combine the two lines at top because they're almost the same. There are slightly different variants of a drug, the drug that I showed you on the very first data slide, the drug that had 40% mortality <laughs> in our trial. So combine those two together and so they're even bigger. That's the old generic that our new drugs came in to replace. The purple line was our drug as we launched relative to the drug that we showed that mortality benefit against. Um, the green line was actually the last drug to go through this process with a big pharmaceutical company. So it's with AbbVie now, but it was developed by Forrest. Um, so they had a lot more muscle behind it. They also had early to market move for a really interesting regulatory story. Um, and actually the dip is a stock out because they didn't supply the supply chain enough because it's just not that profitable. Um, so they had a stock out where they ran out of drug for a period of time um, because of the expense of filling that chain I was telling you about. But regardless, all of the new drugs, despite eventually, not all of them had the type of data we had at the beginning, but eventually they all generated data showing these were vastly superior products, are being outsold by the old generics still, even after the trial data. And so this is kind of the challenge we face. So then I tried to think of a few personal examples because several have come up like this year. Um, so I just wrote three notes to myself and then I have some cheat sheet. Um, so the first was my neighbor. So my neighbor, I guess, had, so he, I, he must have had an abdominal mesh, maybe for a hernia or something way back in the day, but he got an infection. He was telling me the story, oh yeah, I thought I had belly button lint and then it, it got worse, I went to the doctor and I had an infection, right? 
And I said, oh, what drug did they give you? He said, Keflex. I was like, okay, I know Keflex. Um, I said, hopefully it's not MRSA. But I said, yeah, I know that drug. Um, and so then, he, a couple days later, he's like, oh man, it got like way worse, my infection and uh, you know, at the site and this and that. And so they put me on, on I'm like, what they put you on? Probably Zyvox. He's like, Zyvox, yeah, how'd you know? I'm like, um, and so I said, well, what'd the doctor say? And he said, she said I was allergic to the Keflex, and so she switched me. And I was like, that's such a lie. So you're allergic, but you're only allergic right where the infection is. Like, you know, you have an aller allergy to a cephalospore and your entire body is gonna turn itchy and hivey. Um, I said, you know, Keflex costs $3.64 a day. Zyvox is $38 a day, that's really expensive. Um, so you got the cheap stuff first, and they're probably covering their butt that that drug did not have coverage for MRSA, and it was worth rolling the dice for $3.64. Keflex was approved in 1971. Like, as an antibiotic developer, it's just super frustrating to see this happening. And he doesn't know. The doctor gave him antibiotics. How many people even ask, how'd you pick this one? Why this one? What do you think this is? Like, what's the evidence base this will work or not work? He didn't know. The other was uh, my, chair, my, my uh, chairperson, she, she was telling me a story where, um, obviously she's familiar with our, you know, what we do now, so she thinks about antibiotics more, but she took her doctor, daughter in for swimmer's ear, uh, so I had an infection, and the doctor said, well, I can you give her Augmentin or Cipro? These are like, they're both antibiotics, but they're as different as you could possibly conceive of in terms of choices, and I said, well, that's interesting. What the heck did she think she had that, that could be that big of a difference between what she would prescribe? And she's like, ah, oh, she didn't say. But I was like, well, how'd she decide what to use? And she literally said, oh, the doctor said, let me see which one's cheaper. And she went on the computer and searched it to pick which drug she gave her. Um, that's disturbing. The most personal one that I, I saw firsthand was um, uh, my, my wife just had to have a procedure down here, at Ronald Reagan. So we came down to UCLA. Um, it was totally planned. It was something she was trying to get fixed. But it was a serious surgery. It was invasive. She had to stay in the ICU overnight, right? Although there were no beds, so she had to stay in recovery overnight. Um, but, you know, it was very serious surgery, um, and of course, I'm a pain in the butt. So they hang the bag, and I'm like, why are you giving her stuff as Olin? Like, what are you doing here? And um, they're like, oh, this is, it is, it is, it's the medical guidelines. But I said, you know, aren't you worried about MRSA? And they're like, oh, no. I'm like, well, you guys publish a study, your hospital, the MRSA rates are so high in the LA metro area, they're so endemic that you don't even isolate patients anymore. But the drug you're choosing to protect her during her surgery doesn't cover that pathogen. Explain, and then of course they're, I let my wife's like, leave them alone. And I'm like, <laughs> um, Cefazolin, $33.54 a day for that IV drug. Ceftarolin, a drug I never worked on, um, but it has MRSA coverage and an equal safety profile, $147 a day. So okay, it's, it's $100 more expensive. Her procedure, we got the bill the day before I left, $82,142.08 to do the procedure, and they used a $33 antibiotic to protect her with no coverage for a pathogen that they published at their own hospital was so endemic, they don't even bother to isolate patients anymore. So it's hard to work in this field when you see that kind of stuff going on. Um, I'll just finish with just two more quick, quick notes because I'm really excited to hear questions. Um, what are we trying to do about it? So for a long time it's been tough. For over seven years we've been trying to get some kind of legislation to solve that revenue problem, right? We want Ultimately, when I started talking to reporters after occasion, I was like, you tell me, do you want us to solve this now or do you want us to wait till there's millions of people? And if you want us to solve it now, you have to admit that it doesn't work under the current system when there's only tens of thousands. So what is ultimately, the governments have done what they can do. NIH is funding research. Um, Medicare is doing everything in their power to try to reimburse these drugs more, but they cannot do any more than they've done, which isn't enough, without Congress acting. So there's two ways we were trying to solve this. One of them is seven years old. My first trip to DC really to lobby was, was for this Disarm Act. And the idea is it's trying to take that issue out where the, in the hospital, the hospital's paying the bill for your drug, which creates this incentive to like maybe try to go cheap. Um, we just wanna take that out. For some reason, it's been super controversial and no one wants to do it because they're like, oh, it's, you're gonna get high drug pricing. You are gonna get high drug pricing. That's the only way to solve this, right? But, um, the other is more new, I would say, um, and the idea is, and the, UK gov the European governments are trying this too, that's called the Pasteur Act. Here, the government's saying, okay, when you get to market, we're gonna buy $300 million worth of drug a year for 10 years if you hit these really high metrics, like you can treat all these infections. They're basically inflating the size of the market early to let you capture that value. They're both perfectly viable. There's a fight over how to do this now. The good news is, after all these years, I spent so many years at conferences with like, Great groups, but like Pew Trust, Welcome Trust, they're all like, oh, just worry about stewardship. 
the economics are fine. Now everybody's on board. The economics don't work. Um, we've kind of proven that out. We've really explained it thoughtfully. And now we're fighting over how do we fix it, <laughs> not do we fix it. So it's a start. Um, but these are really the two pieces of legislation um, that are sitting out there now. DSRM was actually in the COVID relief bill for March 2020, and it got pulled out on the Saturday session, which was really heartbreaking because it was like this close. Um, the argument was it's such a small bill, it's only $10 billion, we're not even going to notice. It's in the $3 trillion appropriations. <laughs> Um, Pasture is actually part of what will be CURES 2.0, which is a big piece of legislation to build on the CURES Act, but it's a long road to see if that ever um, you know, gets enacted, and by the time it does, is it diluted out so much that it, it doesn't work. So hopeful, but these are the types of things, but at least people are talking, and obviously both these things have been bipartisan for years, so that's not the issue. It's just getting something across the finish line. Um, so just to kind of just sum up the thoughts real quick. So it's really hard science to find new drugs, and I spent most of my career the beginning half on that. Um, now we've got this economic problem, and we can't sustain our research groups and our core you know, knowledge in this space unless we solve the economics. We, if we do solve that, we'll still have the science problem, <laughs> so we've got to still deal with that. Um, you know, the, th the real problem in this space is there's this limited time during a limited window to get the value back for all the money you've risked. It's not my money, it's the investor's money. I gotta tell them I can give it back to you. Like that's the hardest part when you wanna go raise money. Um, society gets to benefit for decades, right? The drugs we use mostly are generic that someone else developed a long time ago, but no one's willing to do this anymore unless you let that innovator company capture some of that value back to pay their investors. Because if you don't, they're not gonna be able to get new investors to do it again. Um, the, and then the real big push just in the last two years was this thesis, like really showing the costs are normal and they're everything people want us to do it's the revenues that's the problem. And then now we're down to like, how do we want to fix this? And there's multiple ways to fix the math. Um, how do we want to do it? So I'll, that's pretty much it. I'll close with that and I'll just say, thank you so much for being interested in this topic. People thank me for talking about it, but I'm excited people care about it. Um, so glad to have the forum. And I'll leave this up while we're talking, which is, this is just two years of passive sitting on my butt, people calling me. Like the world is waking up. Like how many different, you know, the bankruptcy of a Cajun lit a fire. Not a particularly good fire for me, but hopefully for everybody else, right? That we actually get this fixed. Um, and we're just getting started. Um, but there was a tremendous amount of interest in this space. And in about two weeks, the Milken Institute will be doing, having their annual meeting right um, just, I don't know, 20 miles from here. Um, and that'll be a major focus there as well. So at least we're getting attention on the issue. Um, it did cost me when I first started up, but I just started another one, so it's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for such a wonderful and informative presentation. Um, if anyone in the audience has questions, please line up behind one of the two microphones here at the front of the room. Um, please make sure to keep distance between each person and try to limit it to about three to four people per microphone. Thank you. Oh, and when you go up to ask your question, please be sure to state your Name, uh, college, major, and I think that's it. Name, college, and major. Hello, my name is Ivrihan Vasquez, uh, CMC junior, uh, biology major. Uh, so my question was, uh, like, what do you perceive for the legislative barriers and like this issue? Like, what seems to be like the commonality as to like why these bills haven't been passed and like. How do you like foresee that being like overcome, you know, before like catastrophe strikes? Yeah, I mean, one of my favorite trips to DC was when Disarm was new, and I told the story at dinner, so they've already heard it, sorry. But um, I got sent in to talk to the staffers that were working on the, so they've always had bipartisan support in Congress, you know, and the Senate. So you talk to the staffers, the healthcare staffers of those representatives, right? And I went in, they're like, you know, we're really worried about the antibiotic crisis. What do we have to do to fix it? I'm like, oh, it's really easy. We just have to massively increase drug pricing. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we're not doing that. I'm like, I know you're not doing it. That's why we're doomed. I'm like, we're really caught in this mess of, you know, there's this extreme of drugs that make massive amounts of money, and then this problem that needs price to solve it or find some backdoor way. But honestly, the subscription plan is just a backdoor way to solve it. It's the same. Um, and we're caught up in this web of, you know, how, it's a counterpoint. So it's just education that it's inevitable. Like trying to explain, this really is how it is, guys. Like this, there's no other way to solve this problem and you know, l laying it out. People do listen. I mean, the representatives listen. How they, you have to pick one that wants to wager on that. 
it's not easy in this environment. Anything that's you know, pro pharma um, is, is difficult. But you know, I think ultimately the problem will get worse and we will solve it before it's really bad. And where those lines intersect, I have no idea. Um, so, so we watch and we wait. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Ziad. Um, go to Claremont McKenna, I'm a senior. Um, thank you for your talk. I think a lot of us, including myself, learned a lot. Um, so I kind of wanted to give like some thoughts and then ask a question at the end. Mm -hmm. So yeah, hearing your talk and everything that you've been saying, it's scary to me that there's so much economic presence in medicine. I'm sure like lots of consumers of drugs, every American, everybody in the world can agree. Um, money is needed to sustain drug development and for innovation, but also you are counting on revenue to strictly go to that self-sustaining process of drug companies. Um, or in other words, you count on CEOs like yourself um, to be ethical. Of course, the FDA and like other organizations that prevent drugs from getting to market have all these costs and trials that you were talking about that prevent a drug from being approved until it's actually safe, which is really good for customers or like consumers because we trust that there's some level of safety to drugs, but of course they're bad for companies like yours because these costs are making it impossible to bring these drugs to the market. Um, so I guess my question is, how often will you try to bring a drug to market knowing that there may be safety or efficacy concerns, either short term or long term, that, that you know of, but you need the money to continue doing these trials and to like sustain your company? Um, yeah, so just, can you read just that last, because I'm thinking about all the parts you said, the last like 10 words you said. Yeah, <laughs> so make sure I miss the main point. Yeah, so I'm saying how often will you try to bring a drug to market knowing that there may be these safety or e efficacy concerns, either short or long term, but you know that you need the money to continue doing trials and like sustain your company. Got it. If I'm understanding that, I mean, right now it's worse to be on the market. That's the weird conundrum. It's better to be early stage. There was a period of time where the earlier stage companies were more valuable on the NASDAQ because of this knowledge that, so no one's rushing to try to get to market cheap because it's worse when you're on market than when you're in development right now. Um, the FDA has made great con strategic concessions on the trial designs. I wouldn't want them to do anything less. I think we're fine where we are and as a developer, you're terrified that someone will get hurt by your drug, right? You know the upside, you're working on something life-threatening, so you have to weigh that it's a challenge. Um, and you do tremendous amounts of testing to try to minimize it, but that's always a fear as a scientist is like, that's the risk. You're putting something in someone's body, it could do damage. And um, so I don't think you'll see people rushing to market, kind of being tongue in cheek about it because it's worse when you're on market. Um, the FDA has streamlined in a way that um, we have really clear scientific understanding how to get these drugs approved. It's not that expensive when I say it's only a couple hundred million dollars, but honestly that's not for the scale. The, but the one thing that is killing, like the manufacturing is just, the, the manufacturing of our drugs is probably worse than the manufacturing of Humira, which makes $40 billion a year in sales or some ridiculous number. Um, so that's really tripping us up. So if you, no one's rushing to market to cut those costs because those costs aren't what kill, what's killing us. The actual commercial operation of manufacturing drug and distributing it and m managing all that, that's the bigger expense anyways. If that's any, it's not the best way to reassure, but it's a reassuring thing that the trials, we're not gonna cut anymore from there. The standards we have are good and we shouldn't reduce them. That, that's the hard thing, the company doesn't wanna reduce any of these standards. That's why we talked about the cost, but then you have to make it balance on the other side, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, my name's Matthew. I'm a senior at Claremont McKenna, majoring in econ and accounting. I uh, really appreciate your talk. This has been really interesting to kind of learn more about both the science and the economics of antibiotics. My question concerns kind of the revenue piece that you were speaking to with the, uh, the hospitals being the payers of these drugs rather than the insurance companies. When you look at international markets like in the UK or Europe where they have a different system of paying for these drugs to begin with, do you see different economic problems with that or do they have the same problem with that model that we have over here or do things kind of change in that regard when you've got uh, kind of the national insurance provider that pr pretty much covers everything and there's not this split between insurance companies versus hospitals paying for these drugs? 
Yeah, so, so um, yeah, no, thank you. That's a really important question. That's like I said to have all the economics people here because, you know, this is a, ultimately it's a, it's a how do we want to choose to solve it by pay, you know, what, you know how do we want to, and while we're at it, can we solve it for the whole world? Um, my focus is U.S. for now to figure it out, but I mean, ultimately, the tragedy is there's a way bigger need and a bigger market out of the U.S., probably not Europe yet, but, you know, Africa, India, Southeast Asia, um, but if we can't create a market here, there's no product, so it's, we're trying to solve this. Um, it's worse in Europe. <laughs> and the proof is that the drug I worked on, despite having all of the data and everything it needed to seek approval in Europe, the company that bought the asset from bankruptcy declined to finish and just said, we're not gonna appr seek approval in Europe. Mind you, that mortality trial was run in Europe nine years ago. So there are people dying today that could be saved but the, because the government in Europe sets the price and they set it, this is a little bit of sausage making, but they, the government sets it based on the trial data one of the interesting fatal flaws with antibiotics is most registrational st trials, and this is important actually to spread this knowledge because you'll hear this criticism in some articles. Um, we get our drugs approved typically with what we call non-inferiority trials, which means the trial design statistically is set up to show your new drug is no worse than the old drug. And then when Europe goes to price that, they say, well, this is no good, and they, they know full well it's better. Um, we can't demonstrate the superiority we want to demonstrate because when our drug is superior is when the old one doesn't work. And you cannot show that in the trial. If you accidentally show it, you have to exclude that data. You can't enroll resistance to either drug. And so Europe knows better, but they still are like, well, it's not inferior, so they put the price on it. And then three drugs now have um, not even sought approval in Europe. Uh, at least the drug I worked on is on the market in the US. Um, so now Europe's kind of panicking and they're trying to do the subscription model too. UK and Sweden are starting. The problem is Europe's all fragmented. If they could all do it together, it would work. Uh, but you know, having them each have their own requirements and um, yeah, so say I can get a subscription in Sweden for $20 million a year, but I have to go through an entire extra regulatory process with a different country. Is that really worth it or not? And I think you'll see people doing that. If Europe can't come together and figure out how to do it. Um, and so what you're seeing is US and now China. That's where you would protect your rights and want to have the rights to the drug there. And Europe's getting skipped over, which is pretty crazy. Um, but it makes total sense. Thank you, really appreciate it. Hi there, my name is Carter Moyer. I am a sophomore at MUD, uh, planning to major in computer science, interest in computational biology. My main question is, uh, in the circles that I traffic politically, I hear a lot about prize money um, instead of patents for new drugs. I'm sort of curious how that differs from the Pasteur Act um, and how that would interact with your market, the antibiotics. Yeah, well, I mean, it's funny how the vernacular can affect the psychology in DC, but um, so the most important thing is if we do something like Pasteur, where you're getting a guaranteed payment, mm -hmm. so the idea is we're excel increasing the market size for you early because you came to market early and we don't want to let you charge a high price, which is the normal way we solve that, right? Um, is are we making sure, so there will definitely be requirements to con continue to receive those payments. How smart are the people that design those is my concern. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because the first thing you start to think about, and the people that do work on the legislation, say, I'm conflicted, I'm at a company, but I, you know, I know that I'll just poke it. I'm like, oh, if you do that, then companies will do that. And we try to game theory what would happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a concern. The main thing was like, a, if the US government wants to pay me a fixed dollar amount for my patent, I'll take that deal today. Mm -hmm. If I don't have to worry about manufacturing, and do, but the US government's not gonna do that part too. So the thing to not forget is it's not just the patent, somebody has to take the ownership of a commercial supply chain and manufacturing. And that's why too there's arguments, can charities just do this? Yeah, if you're willing to do all of that too. It's not just about getting the drug to market, it's actually a business then to make, distribute, and, and do all that work. Um, the reason generics are so cheap is at the end you get to kind of borrow from all that learning, right, for decades. Um, someone's still gotta do that. So you wouldn't want the prize to be like, okay, the US government now has the patent, great, what do we do with it? Because someone's gotta stand up an organization to actually do that crazy map I showed with all the countries of you know, supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, and the government generally doesn't want to get into, like think about the vaccines. The government could have told Pfizer, we'll buy your patent and we'll make all the vaccine ourselves and we wouldn't have any vaccine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello, good evening. My name is Brandon Karagosian. I'm a sophomore at Pomona College and my major is in public policy analysis. And I had a question about 
equity and accessibility because your argument would be to raise the prices of drugs and antibiotics. And I just had a question on what would that look like for Medicare and Medicaid and for those pushed to the margins of society, how would these drugs become accessible if the prices were to be raised and affordability is already such a big problem in healthcare and policy? Yeah, yeah, and I'm okay solving it any which way, you know, in terms of, I just point out that the, the normal way we solve rarity is price. Um, Medicare has to lead the way, so Medicare patients wouldn't be left behind because Medicare is the one that's setting the tone, telling the hospital, here's a thousand bucks, whatever you don't use, keep it. They're creating the financial conflict of interest and they know. There's even articles, so it's too bad we had the changeover, but Seema Verma was really good about this. Um, you have to toe a line in DC, but she was like, we believe some of the reimbursement policy is driving poor decision making for patients. She, what she's saying is, we're worried people are using cheap drugs and hurting people. So Medicare wouldn't be left out because they actually have to do it. The legislation would make Medicare change what they're doing and then private insurance would follow. And I'm not necessarily advocating for that solution, just pointing out one way or the other, revenues have to go up. Um, but so at least for the US. Outside the US, I'm very concerned. I'm very concerned because one of the great tragedies is if you think about we're creating an orphan to drug, we're not making it on large scale. And our chemistry is really hard. We're doing natural product work, right? So it's expensive. Um, if the market's 10 times the size in Africa as it is in the US, but I'm just trying to survive in the US, I'm not gonna make 10 times the drug. That's crazy. So then where does the drug for Africa come from? Who's worrying about that? We're in such a crippled state, the industry can't even think about it right now, but it's a, if we're gonna solve this, how do we solve that? So I think in the US, we'll be okay because Medicare has to lead the way. Um, but for the other parts of the world, you know, how, how do we solve it? And is it the US's job to solve it? I, I hope it is. Um, but you know, that's, that's, that's the even greater tragedy is the unmet need is already big enough outside to, to create a big enough market. It's just there's no pricing power there and so it's even more broken. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, hello, my name's Trevor. I'm a senior at CMC majoring in molecular biology and uh, I had a question about more of the manufacturing process of the drug. So it looks like, I mean, especially based on that diagram you showed, it's a very involved process and obviously that's where a big part of the cost comes in. And is there any way that, well, I guess my, it's kind of a maybe two part question, which is like, first of all, what makes that process so involved? Like, why do you have to do it that way? Is, and then second, is there anything that could be done to maybe make, streamline it or help that? Or is that just kind of a, just the, like what's required in order to make that kind of drug? Yeah, I mean, it, one thing I didn't want to go into too much is if you look at the structural complexity of the drugs that we make, it's actually a lot worse than like a Lipitor. Um, the maps are complex because like, it's interesting because obviously the US is like, let's bring pharmaceutical manufacturing back because of COVID. And we're like, we can make drugs here, but all the raw materials come from China and India. So the first place you start is that's where you have to go to get raw materials. Um, so a lot of that was raw, like regulatory grade raw material. Um, like even if you need to buy glucose, think about saline, right? When Puerto Rico had the hurricane, we, we, that was the, like, almost the world supplier of sterile saline and we had a shortage. So unfortunately globalization, we sort of created concentrated pockets of capacity. So if your chemistry is easy, you can simplify. Um, but in general, that's not too complicated of a map. I think the redundancy is something you can't afford till you're on market and you must do when you're on market. Um, whereas when you're running clinical trials, you don't have two different manufacturers for that risk of a you know, volcano erupting or something you know, and cutting off traffic. Um, so there's that. Um, the other pieces that I didn't get into is, um, it's funny, but pills are actually a lot easier. <laughs> if you wanna make sterile injectables, so like IV solutions, that's one of the hardest things to do, um, especially you know, there's just not capacity. Um, so we're also in that world where we're doing kind of the more expensive of the two options for, for serious antibiotics. Um, but to your point, the, yeah, the more we can simplify it, the better, but it, it just, I mean, I study this all the time, even for the drug I'm working on now that's not even in the clinic yet, how do we do this? And it's just, at least in the beginning, it's really expensive. You get better and better at it, and then it gets cheaper and cheaper, and then it goes generic. And it's <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's an investment, um, but it, it's a great point, but that really truly is a normal end-to-end -end supply chain map. Um, and so when you're buying that $10 amoxicillin, it's kind of a miracle you can get it for that price, but it took decades of work and probably some substandard manufacturing practices to get you it for that price. In the interest of time, this will be our last question. You can go. Hi, my name is Amy. I'm a senior at CMC majoring in biochemistry. And I was just wondering that um, that first drug that you were talking about, like that whole timeline and how like the company went bankrupt and all that is, 
that drug like completely over now like since it was like it seemed like it was like very promising is it just is it just a dead end like is that drug no longer going to be in the market at all or anything like that or ever used as a treatment yes yeah, so the um so the the worldwide rights minus china were sold to a company called cipla which is an indian generics manufacturer traditionally but they bought the rights um and then i don't remember the name because it did pass hands but the China rights were sold to a Chinese pharmaceutical company. So it's on the market in those two, to the US. It's on the market in the US and China. It's available to be, CIPLA owns the rights to launch it elsewhere, but they're not, because they're not gonna make any money. Um, so luckily there's still access to it, and our data was striking. There are also two other new drugs that got approved since that trial. That trial could only be run in that window when there was nothing else left. Um, so there are drugs that would also do well, right? Um, although. They went bankrupt too, that's what's crazy. We weren't the only one. Almost anyone that went after an unmet need in the hospital went bankrupt except the one drug that the green line because that had the backing of a company that sold Botox so they could lose all the money in the world and just pay for it with their Botox money. Um, this is the difference when the biotechs get involved and we don't have revenue from something else. We can't subsidize the losses. So this whole history was pharma was losing money this entire time and they finally looked and were like, we're done with that. Biotech's like, we'll do it, and then we're like, oh wait, this loses money, and we're like, now we, and we can only raise money by selling stock and taking loans, we can't sell other drugs. And so it's all kind of, all that's really happened is we've just laid out the real problem to bear with the collapses of these companies. Um, so that's the good news, it's all out there, and now how do we figure out how to fix it together? And, and get trust from people in DC that we're not trying to like be greedy, and we're this is really a problem, it's not a joke. Um, so we're almost there, not quite. <laughs> Uh, please join me in giving Ryan Sirs a round of applause.